Let us pray. O holy and loving Father of us all, on this occasion of the birthday of the second father of our nation, we come in gratitude for past accomplishments, and we come in rededication to unfinished tasks and new opportunities. We thank you that in thy provision of every good thing for man's needs, thou hast established educational institutions for the preservation and transmission of what man has thought, achieved, and believed, for the discovery of new knowledge and its application in the increasing control of our environment, for the disciplining of minds, and for challenging men and women to commit themselves to the service of their fellow man. As we assume the name of Ball State University, we pray that thou wilt save us from the folly of emphasizing the part more than the whole, from the pride of claiming too much for our achievements, from the blindness of believing that the good things we achieve should be reserved only for ourselves and our kind. We pray thy continued sustenance upon this institution, the people of Indiana who have made her possible, the Board of Control, her president, her administrative officers, and her faculty and students, and the parents and alumni. It is in the name of Christ that I pray. Amen. Good afternoon. To those of you who are present in the John R. Emmons Auditorium with us, and to those of you in our radio audience, we are pleased and proud to welcome you to the first convocation to be held on the Ball State University campus. The purpose of this convocation is twofold, to commemorate the action taken this week in changing the name of Ball State Teachers College to Ball State University, and to introduce you to some of the people who played a major role in making this change a, rea a reality. The presentation of the colors was made by our Air Force ROTC color guard under the leadership of Cadet Harold. The Ball State Symphony Orchestra, which performed earlier, but also accompanied our singing of the national anthem, performs under the direction of Dr. Robert Hargraves. Mr. George Jones, Director of Religious Programs at Ball State, gave the invocation. We are grateful to them and to the university singers who opened our convocation for their contribution. It's going to be necessary because of the late arrival of some of our participating legislators, the last report we had the legislature was still in session and working hard at 2.15, but we expect it momentarily. As a result, however, there will be some modifications in our program. The Ball State Concert Choir, directed by Mr. Don Nguyen, will sing Beethoven's Hallelujah. While all of us in this auditorium have had a part in preparing Ball State for its designation as a university, certainly no one has been more active and no one is more proud of the action which has been taken than the first president of Ball State University, Dr. John R. Emmons. President Emmons will speak briefly on Ball State yesterday, today, and tomorrow. President Emmons. Thank 
Okay. The members of the State Teachers College Board, members of our legislature are here, platform guests, students, faculty members, and friends. I'm confident I need not tell you that we are here to celebrate a very momentous occasion. The change of name of this institution from Ball State Teachers College to Ball State University. Let me assure you that it's not merely the members of this audience who are interested in this occasion. We have telegrams, we have letters, we have notes, we have telephone calls. I shan't read all of them. There was an official action taken by the Association of State Colleges and Universities at Chicago this week, which uh, indicated that I was to bring to you the message from them of congratulations. And last night, it was my privilege to sit in the grand ballroom at the Conrad Hilton Hotel when the American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education honored 10 institutions in the whole United States for outstanding programs in teacher education, and Ball State was one of the 10. They apologized to us for having in their bulletin, which was printed last week, Ball State Teachers College, and they asked all the members of the audience to cross out Teachers College and write in University. I know of no better way for us to start showing our appreciation for the change in name to, and to say thank you and to indicate our appreciation to individuals and groups who have been involved in this process over many, many years. The very first uh, act that made it possible, for instance, for this to be an institution of higher education was an act of the legislature. And then the act of the Ball Brothers in purchasing the property and making it a gift to the state. And when it became the eastern branch of Indiana State College, to the devoted faculty and staff who built the foundation, who served here the many early years, some of them I'm confident are in this audience, some of our emeritus staff group, who built the foundation for what we say has made possible now this uh, superstructure that we call a university. To the loyal graduates, and the students who have been here and who are now here, and to those who will come, shall we say, because of what happens to these people while they're on campus and what happens to, their, to them afterwards is what shall, in the final analysis, determine the success of this institution of higher education. Our graduates, our students, and their contributions and their lives shall tell the story our appreciation of this community, to its leaders and to its total group, the individuals in our factories and in our businesses and in our total community who have made possible through gifts for one half of this building, made it possible for us to have this opportunity to meet together in a college and community auditorium. And to the State Teachers College Board, which has served in its many, many ways to make possible the kinds of programs we have at Ball State. And now again, we return back to thank this current group in the legislature and our governor for having unanimously passed the bill and having signed it, which makes possible the change of name to Ball State University. The several reorganizations that the we have had on our campus in terms of our academic and administrative structure were necessitated by the increase in the student body, the increase in our opportunity to serve. Beginning in 1918 with approximately 380 students to 1945 with over 1,000, and now this fall to over 10,000, next fall 11, the next fall 12 or more, and the next fall another 1,000, and the next fall another 1,000. Shall you count as far as you wish? And this reorganization is reflected in this commemorative program which you have received by the titles and the assignments of the individuals who are to be recognized. Now, I have tried to prepare a pair of statements. One was the greetings to the Ball State University students, the Ball State University students. Uh, you are in about the same position that I was when I was wearing my badge around and somebody said, how does it feel 
be a university president. Well, I said, I really haven't gotten used to it. It's only been since 2 o'clock Monday that I've been one, and you're in about the same position. But this is the type of greeting I tried to write, and you will find it in the commemorative issue of the Ball State News, which you will receive when you leave the auditorium. At 2 p.m. on February the 8th, 1965, the name of your alma mater was changed and a new period of growth and expansion started. As we become larger and accept new challenges, we should all cherish the idea that we remain a friendly campus. And remember that a university education is the sum total of the experience a student has on and about a college campus. And the converse of that also, that the whole university educates the student. Ball State University must respond to its current and future challenges its opportunities and responsibilities by extending its flexibility, by continuing openness to change, by reaffirming its dedication to people, to individuals, to its commitment to superior teaching, its orientation to this college and community environment, and its devotion to regional service. This does not mean we restrict ourselves to regional service because our service is national, international, as well. The university must expand present programs and curriculum and develop in several new areas, increase its research activity, and be aware of new needs and potential. The university must build on its past successes, on its great traditions, but it must not allow its purposes or its programs merely to be patterned after some other university or university, nor dare it allow its present curriculums to become hardened into narrow, inflexible structures. Our new challenge is to make the image and the visibility of Ball State University one that will deserve our loyalty and our support, and will retain our national and international reputation as a quality institution of higher education. And every past, present, and future Ball Stater has a role to play in the future of Ball State University. Now, the second statement was written for a broader audience. It says, Greetings to Ball State faculty, staff, friends, and all Ball Staters. The material that you will find in your commentary program, the statement, is a combination of these two statements, some parts from each. But this is a statement to the total group. The whole university educates the student. Each curricular endeavor, while given leadership and direction by a division, or a department, or a college, and sometimes even just by an individual within a department, is a business and responsibility of the entire faculty. In fact, each program involves the total university. This concept unites diverse academic offerings into cohesive and united programs. One of the best examples is the principal in the field of teacher education. The Committee on Teacher Education on this campus is composed of representatives from all of the colleges, all the areas. It approves the curriculum, including general education, subject matter preparation, and the professional sequence. The various departments offer the general education and the subject matter majors and minors, and the teacher's college, the professional courses. The library, the residence hall, the student center, the health service, the guidance and counseling center, the clinics, the auditorium programs and other services supplement and augment this total impact of the university upon each individual, a student, faculty member, staff member. So it is with each and every other curricular development on the university campus. Ball State University must respond to its current and future challenges, opportunities, and responsibilities. The university must expand present programs and curriculum. The university must build on its past successes and on its great traditions. You will find excerpts from both of those in your program. Now, in conclusion, let me say something like this. Today, if we accept this challenge. We, we grasp these new opportunities and these new responsibilities, and we dedicate ourselves faculty, students, administrative officers, all of us, we dedicate ourselves to expanded service, to expanded opportunities for individuals, those who are here and those who are to come. And we indicate our desire to devote ourselves to excellence in higher education. 
simply to the end that the future impact of this institution, Ball State University, shall everywhere, by everyone, and forever be recognized, and that we shall all share in the pride of that recognition. Thank you for listening to me. I think it would be appropriate at this time to introduce the four gentlemen who work most closely with President Emmons. I'm going to introduce them individually. I would like to ask that you refrain from applauding, if you so wish, until uh, after I've introduced all four. I'd like to introduce this audience to Dr. Richard W. Burkhart, the Vice President for Instructional Affairs and the Dean of Faculty. Next, Dr. M. C. Byro, Vice President of Student Affairs. He stepped to one side so he can see. <laughs> Third, Dr. Oliver Bum, Vice President for Public Affairs. And Mr. J.C. Wagner, Vice President for Business Affairs. As President Emmons mentioned, on Monday afternoon of this week, February 8, 1965, at approximately 2 p.m., Governor Roger Brannigan signed the Legislative Act passed by the 94th Indiana General Assembly, which officially changed our name to Ball State University. Present this afternoon to present a copy of that act to Ball State University for its archives is the Honorable Robert Rock, Lieutenant Governor of Indiana. Mr. Rock comes from the neighboring community of Anderson, and it is a distinct pleasure to have Mr. Rock with us this afternoon. Mr. Rock. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Emmons, students, faculty, and staff of Ball State University, I am particularly happy to have this opportunity and this beautiful opportunity auditorium to be here this afternoon and take a brief part in this program that has been so well planned and in this week that has been so momentous an occasion here in Ball State University, Muncie, Indiana, and Delaware County. I know there are a great many students from my adjoining county that over the years have gone through this fine institution and who are here now and will come in the future. I think it would be appropriate to bring greetings from Governor Brannigan to you and to the members of the House and Senate and all of the citizens of our state who congratulate you and are extremely proud of this fine Ball State University. Your representatives and senators who will shortly be introduced to you made everyone conscious along with the officers and the president of your fine school of the importance of this legislation and it was expedited. And so I am happy to bring a copy of this act and present it to you and give you our sincere best wishes for continued success as you join the university ranks here in the state of Indiana. I'd like to present this copy at this time to Dr. Emmons. Just for the record, Ball State accepts this document and indicates to you and to all of the audience it would be placed as an important part of our archival and historical records. We thank you. Four legislators were kind enough to sponsor the legislative act in both houses of the 94th General Assembly to father it 
and see it through to a successful enactment. We are particularly pleased that they are here this afternoon, and I would like to introduce them to you at this time. May I again request that you withhold your applause until all four have been introduced. Representative David Metzger from Muncie, Indiana. Representative Metzger, I might add, is an alumnus of Ball State University. Representative George Stevenson from Yorktown. Senator Rodney Piper from Muncie. Is Senator Keith Fraser here? Oh. These are the three gentlemen who fathered the bill for us. A small group of people who through the years have helped guide the destiny of this university to its present position of eminence is one which seldom attracts much attention or publicity, yet its impact on the university is second to none. I am speaking of the Board of Trustees of Ball State University, formerly called the State Teachers College Board. The president of the board is a well-known Muncie industrialist, Mr. Alec Bracken. Mr. Bracken has served as an officer of the board since 1954 and as its president since 1958. I would like to introduce Mr. Bracken to this audience and request that he in turn introduce his fellow board members. Mr. Bracken. Dr. Vicker, President Emmon, members of the legislature and guests, <clears throat> I have the honor of presenting two of our uh, board members who are on the platform today. Mr. Kenneth Osborne, Vice President of the Board from LaPorte, Indiana, and Ms. Thelma Ballard of Marion, Indiana, who is Assistant Secretary of the Board. You may now applaud. <laughs> The other two members of um, the board are Mr. Floyd Hines of Connersville, Indiana, the secretary who unfortunately was unable to be here today, and Mr. William Wilson, who serves ex officio as a member, he being the state superintendent of public instruction. Well, certainly we're very proud to be the first board of trustees of Ball State University. However, I think that um, I would have to admit that there is just a small tinge of sadness, perhaps, in uh, ceasing to be the Indiana State Teachers College Board. My reason for saying that is that uh, it has been in this capacity that we have shared with many of you in the adventure and uh, endeavor which has brought Ball State to the very proud and a highly regarded place where it stands today. And of course, what I'm referring to is one of the leading educational institutions in this country in the training of teachers. And certainly, this is a great honor for any college to have achieved, and I think particularly Ball State, when one realizes that it's been done in a relatively short period of time. After all, it was only 1918 when the school became a state-supported institution. But today, we look ahead, and certainly in our new status as a university, we, sh we take great pride. But also, I'm sure that I speak for all members of the Board of Trustees when I express to you our very fervent hope that in these years ahead, we do not for one moment minimize the importance of our continuing to train successful teachers, skilled teachers, teachers who can go out into the public schools of this state and other states, and also who can go into the colleges of this country. This doesn't mean at all that we're not going to broaden out into other fields. We are. 
and I'm sure that our new status as a university is going to help us in doing this very thing, in getting into these additional educational uh, fields which can now be offered at Ball State University. And so, as trustees of Ball State University, we are very happy to share with all of you today the honor of our new status. We pledge to you that we will try our best to live up to a university board of trustees, and to all of you, we wish our very best. Thank you very much. Such a recognition ceremony as this would not be complete without requesting a brief response from the current leaders of four groups of people, people, all of whom are a part of or closely related to our university family. First of all, speaking for the community of Muncie is the Honorable John V. Hampton, Mayor of the City of Muncie. May I present Mr. Hampton. Thank you, Mr. Pritzker, President Ammons, Lieutenant Governor Rock, distinguished platform guests, and faculty and students. It is my privilege today <clears throat> to represent the citizens and the government of the city of Muncie on this most memorable occasion. The changing of the name of this institution, of course, does not in itself add to the high opinion now held in our community of Ball State. We all know that this is well-deserved and well-earned official recognition of the status and prestige so well-deserved. Our city has demonstrated its interest and its pride in Ball State many, many times. The actions of the community have spoken and will continue to speak much louder than any words that I can add to this ceremony. We have a relationship between the community and this institution which is unique and which has been beneficial to all of us. We are proud of the progress of Ball State and we recognize the tremendous beneficial impact it has upon all of Muncie. I'm certain that each and every citizen of Muncie feels today that we all share in the glories of this higher status now achieved by our school. And so now, therefore, in recognition of this achievement, and to ensure a continuing awareness of the significance of Ball State University in Muncie, I do hereby declare and proclaim that the date of February 8th shall henceforth be known as a holiday in Muncie and shall be known as University Day. And I ask that it be appropriately observed by the university as well as the community. Thank you. becomes the most popular man in the city. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out the implications of that statement. <laughs> Secondly, speaking for the, our student body, is Mr. Michael Lewis, President of the Student Senate. Mr. Lewis. Thank you. Institutions of higher learning were made for students. It is the quality of the students on which the reputation of these institutions ultimately depends. The student makes the university worthy of the name, for a university is more than a name change. It is composed of more than a math building, a gymnasium, and a dormitory. It is more than a weekend party, a fraternity, or a football game. The university consists of more than an administration making rules or a faculty giving lectures. 
Certainly these things are important, but we can have all of them and still not have a university. For a university is a state of mind, it is an attitude, a feeling. It is a place where minds clash over new ideas and experiences. It is a place where one comes to know different backgrounds of people and their beliefs. In a university, the lecture is not left in the classroom, but it is applied to one's own life pattern. You can see what a university means in something so small as engaging in a lively discussion over a cup of coffee in the tally. The administration and faculty have gone far in creating the university in the truest sense. The reorganization of the college into a university, which we are recognizing here today, is a fine example of their splendid efforts. But the final achievement of university status must fall on the student. The legislature, the administration, and the faculty have provided the form of the university. It is up to us to provide its spirit. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Lucille Clifton, Vice Chairman of the Faculty Senate and a Professor of English. Dr. Clifton will speak for our faculty. Dr. Clifton. President Evans, honored guests, faculty, students, and other friends of all states. Had, I, had you told me 17 years ago when I appeared on this campus that I would be standing before an assembled group of faculty, students, and friends of all states to speak for the faculty upon the exciting occasion of assuming university status and responsibility, it would have seemed incredible. But incredible as it may seem, here I am. And I am very pleased, for I feel able to do so because I have witnessed and shared with many of you much over these years. However astonishing any event may seem in prophecy, it is even more astonishing in retrospect. As I remember the college when I first knew it, what we have today is rather marvelous. At first, we were all huddled around the old circle drive, and we all tried to park on it. <laughs> I walked up to my office up a street which ran straight through the spot where the student center now stands. Housed in the arts building, I bumped elbows with social scientists, foreign linguists, artists, and musicians. I gathered my own mail from a common faculty room in the administration building. I knew or had seen most of the students I met. Now great, albeit inadequate, parking lots stretch in all directions. I attend meetings regularly in the student center. The English department has been moved safely away into quarters of its own with mail <laughs> delivery. I am surprised when I step outside our sacred circle to meet a student who speaks to me. <laughs> Although there have been losses with our gains, the profits are by far the greater. More than four times as many students are working toward higher education with a proportionate number of faculty member to members to help them. At least four more classroom buildings, a student center, an auditorium, a theater, Many more residence halls extend their services, but size and number alone do not bespeak progress. However, they have made possible variety in curricular offerings, increased library holdings, and material for experimentation and research, which have greatly enriched the life of the student, faculty, and community. The old Faculty Advisory Council has now become a faculty senate, in whose name I have been asked to speak for the faculty today. We feel justly proud of our college, that our college has become a university, for so it has, not in name only, but in, in its function. But it is to, not to the past years we are looking today. They are over and done, well done. But Ball State is only beginning its career as a university. It's a very young university, less than a week old, and it has much to learn. Its great size will not assure its success. It may make it only clumsy and timid, but its strength will lie in the increased efforts of the faculty in experimentation and research, most particularly in the classroom. 
in the students who will strive to attain the knowledge, understanding, and maturity for which, which will mark them as university men and women beyond these walls, in an administration who will facilitate these endeavors, and in a community and state which will, will support such an institution with its faith and its funds. Even as we know the rest of you do, we of the faculty pledge our skills, our patience, our trust, and our learning to these ends. Our last speaker is Mr. Lee Morris, President of the Ball State Alumni Association. Mr. Morris will speak for the 23,000 plus alumni who are scattered throughout the 50 states of this country and live in numerous foreign countries. Mr. Morris. In the past, we have had a light which flickered. In the present, we have a flame which burns higher. And in the future, we shall have a light which shines over all the land and sea. These words of the late Sir Winston Churchill were written more than a quarter of a century ago. But I think they couldn't be more appropriate if Sir Winston had written them especially for this occasion. On this very memorable day, for alumni of Ball State University everywhere, may I express our sincere gratitude to Governor Brannigan, Lieutenant Governor Rock, and members of the Indiana General Assembly for the expression of faith in our alma mater, which conferral of university status has indicated. To President Emmons, members of the faculty and administrative staff, May I express our appreciation for your leadership, inspiration, and devotion. Your traditional dedication to excellence has made it possible for Ball State to grow not only in size, but in purpose, educational contribution, and service to the state of Indiana as well. In the years that are to come, May the light which flickered in the past and which flames higher in the present truly become a light which shines over all the land and sea. We salute Ball State University and will proudly continue to support it. Many people have asked in recent weeks, what is the difference between a college and an, and an university? One answer might be that a college is one complete entity, while a university is usually a collection of colleges and related administrative units. As of the fall of 1965, Ball State University will have four colleges, each of which will have as its major administrative officer a dean. At this time, I would like to ask Vice President for Instructional Affairs, Dr. Richard Burkhart, to briefly introduce the dean of the various colleges. Dr. Burkhart. Dr. Visser, President Emmons, members of the board, distinguished guests, faculty, friends of the college, whoever planned this program did it just right. They saved the best for the last. The dean. <laughs> Dr. Visser has indicated that the university is thought of as an institution with many colleges and in many purposes. And in this sense, Ball State Teachers College has been a university for some time. Today, as we recognize our university status with this new title, we also recognize that we have had some divisions within the college, which we're changing from divisions to colleges. Today, two of the four deans of the four colleges are with us, and two are working in Chicago. 
Dean Earl Johnson of the Teachers College, who's in Chicago today, with Dean Lloyd Nelson, newly appointed Dean of the College of Fine and Applied Arts. Today we have with us on this platform Dean Robert Carmen of the College of Sciences and Humanities, and Dean Robert Bell of the College of Business. I'd like to ask these gentlemen to stand. Dean Carmen and Dean Bell. I would like to echo some of the thoughts that have been given already. The university is more than a title covering a group of colleges with different ideas and different contributions. The university is to be a central core without which the colleges could not exist. The university provides the basic purposes to which all the college contributes. It's been already indicated that the students in a university will inevitably draw from more than one college as they seek a university education. The name university opens new doors for us. The diversity and variety offered by the university give us room to expand intellectually and spiritually in keeping with our physical expansion. John Macefield, on a similar occasion, uh, wrote an interesting poem, a portion of which I would like to read at this time. Mr. Macefield makes four points. There are few earthly things more beautiful, more splendid than a university. In these days of broken frontiers and collapsing values, when the dams are down and the floods are making misery, when every future looks somewhat grim and every ancient foothold has become something of a quagmire, wherever a university stands, it stands and shines. Wherever it exists, the free minds of men, urged on to full and fair inquiry, may still bring wisdom into human affairs. There are few earthly things more beautiful than a university. It is a place where those who hate ignorance may strive to know, where those who perceive truth may strive to make others see, where seekers and learners alike, banded together in the search for knowledge, will honor thought in all its finer ways, will welcome thinkers in distress or in exile, will uphold ever the dignity of thought and learning, and will exact standards in these things. They will give to the young in their impressionable years the bond of a lofty purpose shared, of a great corporate life whose links will not be loosed until they die. They give young people that close companionship for which youth longs, and that chance of endless discussion of the themes which are endless, without which youth would seem a waste of time. There are few things more enduring than a university. Religions may split into sects or heresy. Dynasties may perish or be supplanted. But for century after century, the university will continue, and the stream of life will pass through it. And the thinker and the seeker will be bound together in the undying cause of bringing thought into the world. To be a member of one of these great societies must ever be a glad distinction. I think we are here today proud to have become one of these great societies. As an appropriate conclusion, excuse I me, think Mr. President. Uh, Senator Fraser is here and should be introduced. Senator Fraser, could we get you on our platform? <laughs> <laughs>
Senator Fraser is the fourth sponsor of our legislative act. And he comes from Portland, from our neighboring county of Jay. Is that right? Yes. And we're awfully pleased that he got, did you just get in at the last just moment? Just the very moment. We're awfully pleased, however, that you are here, and I want this audience to meet you. Senator Fraser. Thank you. You want to say a word? You're uh, welcome. Uh, just a couple of words. Please. Thank you so very much. I'm cold, I'm tired, extremely fatigued. I'd like to say just this much, that I am glad to have been a part of bringing this high honor and distinction to this university. And this is the first half. The second half, and I shall fight for you, is to keep this from being a, an extension center of Indiana University. Thank you very much. <laughs> With all this working for us, we cannot lose. <laughs> As an appropriate conclusion to this commemorative convocation, the Ball State Glee Club, under the direction again of Mr. Nguyen, will sing the Ball State alma mater. And while they are preparing to sing, may I extend a hearty thanks to all of you for attending this convocation and sharing this hour with us. I think you were aware that we had to extend the program at the beginning it certainly did become a little long, but we are pleased that you are as patient as you are, and we are grateful to you. Many people worked very hard to arrange this convocation, people like Miss Marie Fraser and her very able staff. And we are particularly indebted again to Ball State's fine musical organization under the direction of Dr. Hargrave and Mr. Nguyen for their performances this afternoon. I'll refrain from mentioning any other names, lest I may omit some except to say thank you to them and thank you to you.